Hello and welcome to COCA's second artist talk in support of our current exhibition, Not Your Monolith. Please be advised that this uh, uh, event is going to be recorded for later use on our social media for anyone who wasn't able to join us for the live event. Um, so if you do not wish to appear on screen, please uh, close out your video option now. It's, linked, it's uh, located in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Also, uh, Zoom calls can get a little bit echoey if we have, depending on like room size and things like that. So I ask all of our viewers uh, to please mute your screen also located at the lower left hand side so we can make sure we are as clear as possible. Now that we've gotten those housekeeping things out of the way, hello again. My name is Nat Thornton and I am the curator here at the Center on Contemporary Art. I will also be serving as your moderator for this evening. I would like to first start off by saying an emphatic thank you to all of our participating artists and our partner organizations. Without whom, we would not have been able to present this powerful exhibition. Um, in order to bring all of this uh, together and to bring this exhibition to you and our audience, we have partnered with five um, BIPOC-centered arts organizations, Wanawari, La Sala, a Latinx artists network, the Asian Pacific Cultural Center, Napantla C Cultural Arts Gallery, and Crow Shadow Institute of the Arts, each of whom nominated all of the participating artists for this exhibition. I would also like to say a uh, special thank you to the artists who are here with us today who are donating um, their time to be with us tonight. Thank you to Anouk and Quinn, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, to get started, each of the artists will tell us a little bit about themselves, their artistic practices, and about their piece in the exhibition. Um, I'll then ask them a couple of questions uh, specifically about themselves and about their artwork, and then we'll move into the uh, group, our group questions uh, to be answered by anyone who would, who would like to. So uh, Anouk, would you please start us off? I'm going to share my screen so we can see your... Okay, okay. So from the beginning. Oh, Sorry. So we're going to share this screen. There we go. There we are. Uh, hi, everyone. I uh, first want to start off and say uh, thank you to uh, Coca for having me. And thank you for La Sala for nominating me. Thank you to Nat uh, and everyone at Coca for putting the show on. It was an awesome show. I went personally to go see it and um, it was really good. Um, kind of nervous. I don't know if you guys can tell. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, it's like a, yeah. Uh, so where do I start? Uh, so I'm a new Groxon. I'm a visual artist. Uh, I use mixed medium. Uh, I'm originally uh, from Sacramento, California. I'm a Mexican uh, Chicano, uh, queer artist. Um, I'm also a curator. I've curated uh, for the past five years, co-curated with Jordan Christensen and Ade O'Connor. We uh, curated uh, Imminent Mode for the past five years where we take uh, artists and designers and we pair them up and they make a wearable art and then we have a fashion show and there's installations. So that's one of my, uh, something that I hold dear to my heart. Uh, and also I have a clothing line called Pink Halloween. Uh, and uh, that's I, with my partner uh, in business, uh, Jordan Christensen. And so those are some of my creative outlets, out, you create outlets, you know? And then uh, um, uh, also, um, you know, uh, uh, a little background. I'm, uh, live here in Seattle, uh, live on Capitol Hill, and I uh, have my studio here on Capitol Hill. Uh, I uh, originally am from Sacramento, California. I don't know if I, you know, uh, I've always been inspired by art, music, fashion, and, you know, culture, subcultures. Uh, I just, anything that I can find beauty in I'm, or can inspire me, that's always been my inspiration, you know. Uh, uh, when I was younger, I moved to Paris. I was, uh, I don't know, searching for, I guess, Josephine Baker or something, my muse or something. And then I um, moved to New York. And then when I was done, you know, I had a great time in New York. And when I was done in New York, I moved here to Seattle. And um, uh, Seattle has been amazing to me. Uh, this is where I found, uh, got more in tune with my art. You know, this is where I found my witches. This is where I found my 
so many creative people in this little city, you know, and I always say, you know, Seattle's the little city that, that can and does. And I've been here almost 15 years now and I don't plan on leaving. So <laughs> it's just a, you know, just the arts are so strong here and the people are so supportive with one another, you know, um, also to, um, I want to talk about a bit about my process. I have anxiety. So the way I um, work, I work with my anxiety. When I see something that inspires me, I go and, and I, I, in my head, I choose this material that I want to work with and I um, uh, try to get whatever's in my head or and put it out on either whether it's sculpture form or, or it's, it's on a canvas, you know. Um, so there's many uh, ways my process, it's, it's a long process, but I become obsessed with whatever I'm working on. You know, it's, it's constantly, I wake up and it's like, I gotta get this out. I gotta work on this, I gotta do this. Um, uh, also to um, the piece that I uh, did for uh, is Heavy, the, that's in the, the Not Your Monolith, Monolith uh, show uh, is, is part of the isolation series. And that piece is kind of like a, a sculpture of myself. And it, it, start, it happened when COVID, uh, the pandemic happened and COVID happened and, and we were all uh, quarantining and stuff. And, and I just felt so heavy and so like, you know, like just the political climate and everything uh, around me. So I, I, I just started working on this sculpture and the sculpture is actually foam, but it's meant to look like kind of like heavy clay and stone but if you pick it up it weighs like less than five pounds you know um so that pretty much you know describes you know that piece so i hope that made sense <laughs> but that's pretty much a little brief of myself thank you so much um here i'm gonna stop this share so i can ask you some questions about this piece oh here did i all right, so um, your work, you work in a vari variety of different media. So um, how do you decide which best fits with the concept of your project? Um, I think it just depends on what my goal, what, what my goal is to, what I want the outcome to be. Like I, there was a piece I was working on and it was, I started off, you know, vision, a visual and it was a, a plexiglass. And as I worked on it more, it started progressing and it turned into actual glass and actual mirrors. So that piece, you know, it, it speaks for itself. Like the, the, the project speaks for itself. So if, if, if I need to switch over from cardboard to paper or to canvas or to whatever, it's, it's pretty much the, the piece itself that speaks to me on which medium. Oh, I gotcha. Go on. Gotcha, thank you. So what, typically comes first in your artistic practice? Is it the idea or is it the media, media that you're trying to um, incorporate? And how does that media influence the idea or concept that you're trying to portray? It's definitely the idea first. Gotcha. And then everything else, if there's a subject, then that influences the, the project a lot, you know? So, you know, but definitely it's the idea. All right. Thank you so much for um, sharing with us. Uh, Quinn, would you like to um, no uh, share with us some of your uh, thoughts about your work? Sure, sure. There we are. Okay. So, hi, everyone. I'm Quinn. Uh, thank you all for coming in today and letting us share our ideas. Um, you know, during the pandemic and this indefinite isolation. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born and raised in Beijing, China, and immigrated here with my family to the United States when I was a young adult. Um, I was first trained as a traditional painter. Um, like when I was a young adult, my mom would had a friend who was a research scientist, and I would go every weekend to like study Renaissance paintings and like his like really dim lidded basement <laughs> and there was like a dozen of us that just like looked at all this like 
you know, amazing classical Renaissance art. And um, that was my first artistic education. And then my um, art practice has since like involved into like different methods, including like video art and video based installations. Um, so my work typically explores the, the symbiotic nature between like science and mythology, uh, something really uh, empirical and secular with something that's really um, spiritual and natural. Um, I like to kind of explore that area where the, the natural and virtual phenomena intersects and kind of use that as a way to kind of represent the, you know, the modern human experience almost. Um, so, so visually, like I take a lot of inspiration from the internet, technology, um, nature, and popular culture, and these uh, subjects and images from these subjects kind of seep through as the the main visual elements that my pieces are often composed of uh, in both my paintings and my video work. Um, I'm like obsessed and fascinated with like like new visual languages that are formed with like the increased usage of technology, like, you know, the glitches, like the memes and just emojis that are kind of um, inherent to like my experience living in the world now, like whether if it's through my phone or a computer. So in my work, I, I would incorporate a lot of these things and synthesize them together to build this like new, kind of landscape, um, a narrative that I believe to be metaphysically representative of my life. Um, so in my most recent video works, I've been experimenting with um, different ways of expanding and challenging the traditional cinematic experience, um, whether if it's through projecting these two-dimensional videos onto different spatial structures or seeing how light could bend space and vice versa, or by ways of like creating um, just effects and qualities that are previously unexplored um, in, in film or music. Um, I think the most important thing to me as an artist is that I continuously challenge um, the work I create formally, conceptually, and but at the same time, um, to express my most honest opinions. Um, so jumping to this piece I have today with Coca, um, the title of the piece is called Ode to Submission. Um, it's kind of an, an older, shorter experimental video essay of mine from 2016. And it dives in and reflects upon um, modern youth culture, entertainment, and ultimately the, the tendency for one to idolize and be hypnotized by deceitful television personas and celebrities in the present time. So with this piece, I like appropriated a lot of footages from TV shows and concerts, obscured them and um, warped them with these like bright colors, really bright colors to create this almost like kind of hypnotic visual experience. Um, to kind of capture the, you know, the true qualities of what the original content was. Um, so the, I have also a lot of texts in this piece and, and the texts in these pieces are like kind of my reflective thoughts um, on the original content on like just how hollow and deceitful it really is. And at the same time, I've been trying to ex been trying to experiment with like uh, incorporating like different ways of um, incorporating writing into the video pieces I create. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's my art practice. I hope that was helpful <laughs> for everyone. Yes, thank you so much. We, I very much appreciate um, your thoughts and just sharing with us. Uh, a little bit about your creative practice. Um, I do have a quite couple of questions for you specifically. Um, your work involves your your works involve portrayals of fictional spaces, clouds, for example, clouds, arrows, errors, um, entropy, and post-apocalyptic apocalyptic dream. Um, where where do these concepts stem from? Quinn, you're muted. 
Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of these concepts have been coming from like um, my research into like contemporary scientific theories. Um, like in the past years, um, I've been trying to study on my own, like the work of a lot of scientists and thinkers in the field of uh, theoretical physics and um, areas such as quantum mechanics to kind of gain a better understanding of the material universe and um, my relationship to the physical world. I'm like in no way like knowledgeable enough to like really say anything about it, but um, these are the concepts I'm interested in. Um, and I want to incorporate a lot of these concepts into the, into the fictional world that I create because ultimately I want to have um, be telling the truth, you know what I mean? Like I want to be forming informed opinions when I'm um, when I'm creating these supposedly truth truthful um, spaces. Um, so a lot of concepts like like time and space and like very foundational, you know, constructs of how the universe is built in are the things that really inspires me. And I, I try to. Um, incorporate these into the work I make. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for your work in your video installations, um, what role does sound play for these works? And how do you develop the, the sound for your, with, within your concept? Um, you know, I incorporate a lot of sound elements into my video pieces because I think it really enhances a more comprehensive and immersive experience for the viewers. Uh, personally, like I collect a lot of different types of sound, like including ones of nature, like of water or um, ambient sounds or things of tools, like things dropping to the ground or just me typing on the keyboard. And so with each piece, I would like dive into this giant bank of sound that I've created and experimenting matching different noises with different visual sequences. Um, and a lot of times it also involves like warping the sound or like changing the tone of it, slowing down the speed to kind of um, capture that most like surreal or, you know, mysterious combination. Um, and it's also one of the most like fun things for me to work on my, when I'm working on these videos, um, because you end up creating a lot of really strange effects and experiences that are not typically explored in music or film. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, so, um, so before we move into the group questions, I just want to set the scene for this exhibition. Um, the, one of the core concepts of it was this struggle between identity, your internal identity and your external identity, how you view yourself versus how the world views or reads you as a, as a person based on the way that you look. Um, and also this kind of dual struggle that a lot of BIPOC people and BIPOC artists struggle with where it's like you can have your ethnicity, your race is a very, is, set, is a part of your identity, um, but you also make up a, your, your, in, your own, uh, perspective is unique and that's what makes the community so beautiful and so diverse. It's not, while you may have these uh, shared experiences, they shouldn't overshadow and be projected onto people just simply based on the way that they're, they look. So um, with that in mind, can the two of you share with me, us, um, have you ever had an experience where you received feedback or criticism, criticism about your work that it was either too ethnic not ethnic enough or it wasn't what someone expected because of their preconceived notions or expectations i know myself uh from experience uh uh i remember i won't mention the show or anything like that but it was a it was a pride show and um when i it was a group show and 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 uh, i took my um uh, my piece in and and there, you could see the disappointment in their face when it was actually m just my piece, like something that I would do or like, I, it wasn't necessarily, I don't know what they expected. You know, they expected me, to, I mean, as myself as an artist, I art to me, I express myself and who I am. There's so many layers of me, you know? I, yes, I am Chicano, yes, I am queer. 
yes, I am this, uh, you know, like I told you earlier, yes, I'm a witch. Yes, I'm, you know, all this, uh, these layers that make me. And so many times people want to just see one, that one side of you in art, in your artwork, you know? And, um, and so I don't know what this, the guy who did this show wanted from me. And to me, it's like, well, what does he want? Does he want like a penis with a sombrero on it? Like, <laughs> what, what, honestly, like, what do you want from me? It's like, I'm giving you, I'm basically ex giving you my soul on this canvas. And this is what a queer person of color is giving you for this show. But I don't know when these specific shows, I don't know what they want, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I get disappointment, like, you know, I don't know. That's, that's how I can explain it. It's just like, when the expectations are always of like, oh, you're a Chicano, or you're gonna make something that's influenced by your culture and stuff like that. It's like, I'm always influenced by my culture because I am my culture, you know? I'm always influenced by, um, uh, you know, my queerness because I am that, you know? Mm -hmm. But then I have other aspects, like I said, and, you know, and I don't know, but yeah, I've had that experience and I'm just, you know, I just keep doing what I do. <laughs> gotcha, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I do have like a little quick follow-up question. When you receive that kind of criticism or you, you encounter people who are disappointed um, that your artwork isn't what they expected, do you use that, does that ever bring you down or do you use that like as just fuel to the fire? Like, I'm gonna keep doing my own thing. You know, it makes me stronger. It just That's makes cool. me stronger. That's yeah. cool. That's I mean, my whole there. my whole life, I've been fighting and 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 trying. I've always been questioned, like, why you wear that? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? What's your why are your political views that way? I'm always questioned, and those questions don't bring me down; they make me stronger. So that's how it works. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you, um, Quinn. Have you ever had one of those experiences? Sure. I think I've had like very similar experiences, to be honest. Like. Um, I've definitely gotten feedback that my work wasn't um, ethnic or, you know, quotation Chinese enough. Um, and that maybe it's like a subjective experience of mine, but I've definitely felt the, the pressure or the need to like make my work seem more oriental per se, um, because I think that's like really eas easily digested for people. Like, you know, people can immediately understand you when they like see the most obvious characteristics of your culture and the background you're coming from. Um, I think I think the worst criticism I've received is that <laughs> my work looked privileged and then I didn't even really know what that meant at the time. And then that like really, I really struggled with that for a long time, like how, um, you know, my aesthetics can look a certain way um, that's not approved or whatnot. Um, but personally, I think I've, I've came to the conclusion that like, you know, like a lot of the wisdom or the qualities of my culture background can, can be expressed innately and subtly. And ultimately, I, I don't owe it to anyone to represent those qualities in the most obvious ways. Um, because if I believe that's like hindering my work or not. Oh, hi. Uh, so nice to see you. Um, can you tell me how, your, your name real fast just so I know how to pronounce it? Yeah, no, just Che. Che's fine. Che. I have, yeah, yeah. Che. Well, hello there, Che. We, we've been, hello. Uh, we're so happy to see you. Yeah, sorry about that. I, re I read it wrong. Uh, I have two young kids and they were just like, and I was like, what time is it? I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> gotcha. But I'm here, but I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> You're here now. That's what's important. It's better to show up uh, a little late than not at all. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you. We had actually, just to orient you, uh, we're uh, just getting into the group questions, but we're going to rewind it yeah. back just a little bit so that we no can worries. take a look at your piece. Um, let me pull it up and let you uh, speak about your... Um, I appreciate it. No, thank you for that. Sorry about that. I apologize. Oh, yeah. Okay. I need to get onto the screen share. Let me move this, this one. Make it. My turn. There we are. Well, yeah. So, uh, well, my name, my name, my name is, uh, my name is uh, Che Lopez. Uh, and, uh, my work mostly is uh, is going to be mostly traditionally around uh, 
my Mexican heritage, my Chicano heritage. So it's going to be a lot of very colorful images. I do a lot of stuff with the Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. Uh, this one is the Mujeres de las, Cala the Calacas, which is the skulls, the sugar skulls. And I, um, I do a lot of different kind of imagery when it comes to women. Um, and I kind of just want to do something that's very colorful. I was, I'm not a very, you know, as a watercolorist, I'm always traditionally people say, oh, do you do florals? And I was kind of like against like florals, you know, even though they're beautiful. But, but I ended up just putting florals and, you know, a lot of my work now has a lot of flowers in it just because I, I for a lot of times, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a teacher. So a lot of times I teach and they always want to learn how to do flowers. And so um, I, I now incorporate a lot of flowers into my work, uh, a little bit of color. Um, and so, but most of it is traditionally around the Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, um, very colorful imagery kind of stuff. So, and this is where this one came from. Gotcha, thank you. Um, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about your artistic practice, like how you develop a concept for your, the concepts for um, your a lot of just, it starts kind of a, just with the basic shapes, um, you know, like a uh, profile of, of a, a, a shape of a person. And then I, from there, um, I usually just start with uh, letting the watercolor, uh, you know, lay down a wash. And then um, I just go from there. Let uh, There's no real like flowers where, or any shapes in general where I want them to be. I just kind of let uh, the negative shape and the positive shape kind of come forward. Um, and, a lot, and, and, and a lot of ways, actually. So uh, to me, it's more of just like I'm just finding different shapes within the shape. And so, um, you know, uh, and I kind of let the painting kind of move in that direction in, in, a, in a majority of my work. I, I rarely, I, even, even though I do sketches, I don't necessarily stick with them. I kind of let them kind of uh, kind of organically flow in whatever direction um, it might want to go. So I let, I let the color and the shapes kind of dictate where I go. Mm, very nice. Alrighty, I'm gonna stop our screen share. Oops. And then I have a couple of questions for you specifically. Um, in particular, uh, you, you use a lot of uh, color in your works are very bold from what I've seen on your website. And um, I just wondered like, are, is, are you using color to express emotion, a certain emotion or a certain mood or just whatever catches, catches your eye? Um, I guess just, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever catches my eye, whatever looks good. Um, I love color. I love like, I mean, I just, I, I love red colors. I love all these different colors. So I like to be, I like to stand out. Like I don't stand out already. Um, so uh, to me, it just, I just love color. I, you know, I, don't, I, 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 uh, I enjoy just slapping it together. And, you know, again, there's, there's, you know, I'm either playing warmer cools or using a lot of compliments. I use a very simple palette, which is, this is the palette that you see behind me. Hmm. So um, I really don't vary from, from what I usually use. You know, with my primaries, I'm able to kind of create all sorts of different colors. So um, I'm a very minimalist when it comes to a color palette, same colors I've used for 20 years, but I can manipulate them in different ways. Gotcha, thank you. Um, you also mentioned that you're a teacher and advisor to other artists. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to teaching? Uh, I think I've always been a teacher. Uh, also, I mean, from what I remember, my mom always told me that I used to, she, my, mom was, my mother was a social worker and so she would bring me to, different organizations, different meetings, and there'd be kids there. And so, you know, usually with, you know, families or whatever that, that are, you know, parents are being counseled. And so she says, I would sit there and just help tell, you know, kind of teach the kids how to draw or whatever um, at a young age. And my high school teacher was a really big influence on me. Um, she was an artist herself, a watercolorist. So if she, and people always say, how'd you get into watercolor? And I said, well, it's my high school art teacher. If she would have been oil painter, I probably would have been oil painter. Even though now I paint in all mediums. Uh, but I think that's where my career started. You know, I, uh, I've been teaching for close to 15, 20 years in the, North, in the Pacific Northwest in the area. Now I'm a high school art teacher for uh, Summit Atlas High School. So I started working um, this year uh, during the pandemic uh, as a high school art teacher, which is fine with me, uh, but um, I'm, it's exciting. It's exciting. I actually got one of those jobs where there are, I mean, there's no such thing as a high school art teacher these days. And uh, it's, I call this a unicorn job and I got myself a unicorn job. So all I need to do now is on top of becoming a high school art teacher is now become also cap, uh, uh, a football coach. And that is pretty much my dream job uh, since I was, you know, 
a an athlete in high school and uh, and you know president of the art club and captain of the football team. So I am I am that guy does a little bit of everything in high school so gotcha um just like as a little quick follow-up like how have you especially with art how did you have to adapt to your teaching approach or your teaching approach because of the pandemic i don't think it was i mean adapting i don't it was i it felt like it was pretty natural because um when i was teaching students have to, would have to come around me and you know mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a i'm a big guy right so it's like oh, i'm just standing right behind this giant giant bald head where now i have a a document camera which is my iphone which is just directly right over my my painting area and I, everybody's able to look at the screen and you know i can i can um just like in the zoom you can just have it you know spotlight it and uh, they're able to see exactly what i'm doing i'm also recording it so therefore in my classes i can record it and i send them the link so they can go out you know they can look at it afterwards so it, it was a pretty seamless transition and I always thought about doing um, online classes because I did that a lot in the summertime before I uh, took uh, took my high school my new gig um, and, but I was getting students from all over the, the country you know New York New Mexico California um, you know so it's it's been a it's been a nice it's been a nice transition I must say well, that's wonderful that you're making it work when everything else seems so stressful and uh you know, especially I'm as for shocked, teachers. I'm as shocked as anybody else. Um, I mean, I was, I'm, I mean, it only needed a pandemic for me to actually start like being truly like, I, mean, I was like experiencing these rewards, like, you know, all these classes, my class are filling up, people are asking for more and more, and then I get offered this job. And I'm just like, I'm like, you know, I've been around for 40, 46 years. I'm like, it only took a, you know, a pandemic to actually, you know, like fall into my groove, which is very odd and weird for me. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, all right. So we're going to circle back into our uh, group questions. So uh, there is a theme that I've noticed, especially with this exhibition. Um, and the we, ha we asked for additional written materials from each of the artists to, for inclusion in our catalog. Um, I, I keep seeing this theme over and over again, where it's uh, like you're being expected to do one thing based on your um, ethnicity or your race, the way that people view, however they view those, whatever their preconceived um, notions are, but that is often unfortunately very limiting. Um, it doesn't, you know, allow for people to be their whole authentic self if they're being, you know, married to this, some, to some external person's uh, own narrative about what they think. So my question, to the group is uh, what nuances in your art do you think are lost um, when viewers uh, consider you part of a monolith instead of a unique individual? You know, uh, I think our voices are lost. You know, that's the thing that just our voices are lost. You know, we shouldn't be limited to so when, you know, it's one of those things, it's like you group us in together, you know, and you expect just this one, you know, uh, one version of us when there's so many versions of us. And when you limit us, you take our voice away rather than let, you know, let us sing, let us do our thing. Yeah. And that's also very troubling just because art is supposed to be about expression. And if you're being yeah. limited in that way you're not actually expressing yourself. Yeah. Yeah, so like, I think I, I feel the same way. Like, I feel like for me, it's not even just like nuances, but like a fairly large part of my art is lost when, um, when I'm like grouped, when people view my work through like a group identity sometimes. Um, I feel a lot of times when viewers like they group you into these constructs and they and then they feel to fail to realize that you know there are so many other aspects of the human experience that you want to explore as well that's not directly related to your ethnic identity but as individual human beings um like subjects like i've mentioned before earlier like of, of science of ontology or just really cheesy things like what it means to be human or what is what is the meaning of life as conscious beings in this universe like these are all subjects that somehow become irrelevant when my group identity is pronounced 
but like to me, like these are more important questions that I'm exploring um, in my art. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, Shay, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, well, you know, that's a good question. I think I, I, I thought about this a few times and honestly, um, for me, I've never, I guess I am who I am. And what I mean by that is that I, I um, am very confident in what I do. Um, and I tend to um, not really, I don't have these other voices that are behind me trying to, I guess, one of the things about looking this way, I'm a big, tall, brown man, you know, very, I can, people say I'm very, I can be very intimidating. I don't get those kind of questions a lot. I don't get, the, you know, like, what do you think of this? They just, they, they're very standoffish about me. And so I tend to just kind of, I just kind of introduce myself or um, they don't quite know what to think of me. And so I use that to my advantage by, I can very easily just kind of just fade away in, in some ways and just be who I am. They don't really um, challenge uh, me as a person or as an artist um, as much. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's just because, well, the fear and maybe just, you know, but, but I tend to smile a lot to kind of break that down because I can be a very, you know, um, big personality. So I smile like a fool so much that my cheeks sometimes ache. So um, that that's, I guess, in, in some ways, it's just me just disarming people when they first see me. Gotcha. Do you, I just have a quick follow up. Do you ever feel um, not necessarily resentful, but does it ever bother you that you have to put people at ease that, you know, you, that is work that you have to do that, you know, someone else who doesn't look like you doesn't have to do? No, because that's my reality. Uh, and I try not to worry about the things that I can't control. I can't control other people. I can control myself. As a teacher, I try to, I, I try to be, uh, um, let's see, let's see. Whenever I teach somebody, I, I be the best of me, right? I'm always, I'm trying to be the best I can be, the best person I can be. So when someone sees something in the news or they hear somebody like the, like, uh, the president say that uh, Latinos or Mexicans are rapists and they're coming over the country doing this kind of stuff, I want them to remember me. I want to remember, you know, Maestro Che was there. He was a Mexican and he gave his all. He gave his love. To, to, you know, every single time I teach a course, they can see the excitement I have about teaching somebody. So I want them to remember me. I want that. I want, I want me personally to counterbalance. And I bring that to my classes now in high school. I want them to understand that I am the counterbalance. I want them to understand that I am bald Ross and then I will teach them art. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to roll into our, our third question to the group. Um, people are inherently more complicated than what you see in the eye. People hold multiple identities at the same time. You have your cultural, your individual, your ethnic, your national um, identities, and you're all of these things all rolled into one. Um, does, does any of your guys' work explore any of your multiple identities? And if so, and, and how so? Okay, I can start. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I don't think I actively try to, um, you know, explore the multiple identities of mine, but I, I tend to let them come out innately because um, if I am all those things, those things will be visible in my work as well. Um, like, you know, in terms of my painting background, I was classically trained. I've study renaissance paintings for years when I was a young adult and these trainings seep through within your work without you even realizing it um, and while I think a lot of you know traditional Chinese art history and philosophies are ingrained in me and informs the way that I think and the way I express myself I'm also very fond of a lot of western born concepts and um, values so yes I think you know just without even actively trying to do so. Like, I think everyone's work is like, you know, a complex set of cultural values and um, ideas that are picked up from their background or their education, um, especially considering like, you know, the world is fairly globalized right now. Like we have access to the internet, like 
we have access to so many more different, um, you know, cultures and ethics and value structures. And, and these things all inform us um, into creating the work that we do, I think. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, does anyone else have any, any thoughts? Well, most definitely, I think a lot of my work, it, it, it comes from my journey in life, right? And things that inspire me and, and all these different levels, like I said, that, that make up who we are and who I am. You know, um, uh, recently I got some feedback on a, on a residency and they said that my work was all over the place. And I'm that kind of, if you know me, I'm all over the place. I'm just like, you know, I'm just a mess. <laughs> Not a mess, but I was like, you know, uh, but my work's all over the place. When I started out with art, uh, I would make vinyl toys. I made, you know, I started out like that. I would do a lot of plush and then I got into my abstracts and then I've got into like making, I've done a series where it's piñatas. Uh, I've made a series on Grace Jones. I've made a series, you know, so it just depends on my journey and my inspiration. So, you know, um, right now I'm working on, on, a, on a series called La Pulga and it's basically based on my family and how every Sunday we used to go to the uh, La Pulga, it's a flea market that happens on Sunday. And we used to go there every, you know, so this is like a dedication to my mom and my dad and my family. And um, so that, that, you know, that side, my you will see my Chicano side come out of that, my whole culture come out on that side, but then you'll see my, you know, horror film side. I also curate a show uh, called uh, Haunting of Cloud Gallery with uh, my co-curator uh, Jordan. And we make, um, we turn galleries into haunted houses and we make like, you know, so it, it just varies, just varies on, on the inspirations and what you do, I guess. And that's my work, you know, so I guess yeah, I am all over the place. <laughs> you're not, you're not a mess. You're just eclectic. You pick up different <laughs> things and you carry them through. And that's, that's always wonderful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jay, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, for me, for me, I think, uh, you know, I was, I was president of the Northwest Water Clear Society. A couple of years back, and um, you know, it's mostly uh, mostly a white, older kind of demographic, and um, and yeah, I, I kind of just painted a lot of like landscapes and those kind of things. I think I would just, you know, as a person of color, you tend to I tend to blend in. You're able to blend in, you know. Oh, well, I'm very comfortable blending in in different in different kind of groups and situations. I think you have to learn that kind of skill as a as a person of color, um, and then as I as I became, when, when I became the president, I think that's when I became more myself. I could felt like since I am running the organization, you know, which is one of the, one of the largest uh, art uh, watercolor organizations in, in, in the country, I felt like I could be, finally be myself. So I started putting more of my work, you know, more of my personal work, like my Mujeres Las Flores uh, in there, and uh, which was looked a lot different than what you would see, you know, beautiful flowers and landscapes and that kind of stuff. So I brought a little more flavor as you would say, a little bit of sabor into the Northwest Watercolor Society. And um, I was very, very proud of my tenure there that I was able to bring uh, a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of spice into that, so. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your response. I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna preface this next question with, uh, representation is often seen as the the end all be all for like just increased representation that's how we make change that's how like the best way um to go to move forward and to make spaces not only more diverse but more inclusive but um oftentimes that representation is a very it's like a band-aid a quick fix um and doesn't address some of the deeper deeper problems that you have or um, to bring it back to our previous arts talk that we had on Thursday, uh, Tatiana Garamendia, she mentioned that with this representation, you can also lead down other paths that are not so great, such as tokenization, where you kind of uplift certain voices of color and then just continue to give uh, one, two, three individuals a platform without expanding and uh, reaching out to other other people from that community. So my question to uh, our artists is, how do you guys think that we can broaden the general narrative when it comes to BIPOC artists? Um, so I, I think we can all just like broaden the general narrative of BIPOC artists just by like 
you know, allowing and supporting these artists with the freedom and opportunity to explore whatever they want to explore in. Um, like surviving as artists, I feel like it's already really difficult and it would be really unfortunate if like BICOP artists are like, you know, we're socially confined to create work that just propagates like one single facet, one single facet of our group identity. Um, you know, I've always thought that the beauty of art is that it possesses the ability to express the, you know, the complexities or the gray areas of the human experience. And um, whether as a member of the larger community or as an individual. So I, I feel like if everyone can see that, you know, art is possibly one of the only avenues that we have um, as humans to really explore the unknown and accept expressions that are perhaps controversial or maybe obscure, then we would have like a more comprehensive and truthful narrative um, of what it means to be human today in general. Um, hope that makes sense. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Anybody, anybody else? Oh, I think uh, just being yourself, you know, um, I think that's the number one thing you gotta, you know, remember as an artist is just be yourself and uh, don't be afraid to put yourself out there, but also don't be afraid to be, also to don't be afraid to, um, to be different also. And, but, you know, sometimes we put as artists, we want to be, you know, the way I see it, art, we, you know, even though we feel like we're very unique and special creatures, we're really not. This, the same, someone probably painted the same drawing I did on some cave wall, a thousand, some, some, you know, some Mayan wall somewhere, you know. So a lot of times we have this feeling like we want to be uh, uh, different, but we're not. We're all connected somehow. And so what I mean by that is that, is that, it's our experiences that makes us different. Who we are makes us different. Um, our work might show that, but in, in reality, um, in my humble opinion, it's all been done, but just done a little bit different. And so sometimes we take, we, I, think, I think sometimes as artists, we, you know, I hear this a lot where people say, you know, what have you sacrificed to be an artist? Um, art, I have sacrificed nothing. It has given me everything. And so I think we need to keep that in mind and, st and keep in that positive, um, you know, it's unfortunate some artists feel like they really sacrifice a lot and they lost friends or family, which is even crazy for me to even think about because I think I, you know, I've, I've built a community around me um, that enjoy my work, that are my, are my, you know, that I've been teaching, I've been teaching the same group of people, of artists for about five, six years that come, they're with me for that long. And so I think building that community, sometimes we forget uh, and just to be yourself. So that would be my humble two pestles. <laughs> Thank you. And do you have any thoughts? Um, I, I don't. Oh, big, have, big questions. I, just, I do, but. I, no, 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 I do, but it's, it's, uh, it's a lot to think. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, gotcha. No. All right. Thank you. So um, my final question, and we're, we're running a little bit short on time, so, um, so do you, these uh, preconceived notions, you know, we stereotypes, all these kind of things, you just, you see it repeated time and time again throughout history. So I guess my last question is, is like, do you, do you really believe that we can make these big changes that are needed? Do you think that um, we can move the narrative to, towards viewing BIPOC artists as both members of a, you know, of a community with its shared experiences that are important as part of that identity, but also as individuals who have unique viewpoints and unique perspectives? I think we can, you know, uh, I think it starts with us. And then, uh, you know, I think, you know, yeah, it, does. it starts with us and it starts with, you know, uh, gosh, I'm just going, I'm just drawing blanks. But yeah, I think it definitely just starts with us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. I definitely think we can as well. <laughs> I mean, like, I think foundationally, I think, you know, I mean, America's gone through a lot, but it's still like 
one of the best places to be on earth like a lot of other places you know people are suffering like if i was in china i would never be able to make like any political um art and whatnot like and i'm sure in a lot of places people will suffer through that but here i think despite how difficult it may be sometime i think there is still that freedom to really express your thought and i think i mean what's better than that like <laughs> yeah thank you yeah i mean i was born and raised here in seattle so uh, i've seen the progression of the arts in seattle and i think um you know being the only Chicano in my high school being like no like three or four, you know, and then now we get this influx of of uh, Cal, you know Californians coming in, you know Chicanos from California, and just uh, the way the I think in a lot of ways is like the Renaissance. I've seen a lot more organizations like like Coca, like you know, in in different organizations that are popping up with. Uh, with the amount of artists, you know, and you know, people always say, Che, you know, where have you been? I said, I've been here. I'm just older now. I got kids, you know, I, I got, you know, uh, I, I'm no longer, you know, out of high school. And, you know, I, uh, so to me, I, I, I love uh, the youth, the people that, you know, the younger generation, younger artists that are coming in that are, that are um, 100% in, that are doing these mercados, these pop mercados, are doing these small shows everywhere. Uh, and so to me, you know, I'm kind of like step, stepping back and just watching them, you know, let them thrive, you know, um, and to support, like I will support, I will enter shows, I will show my work, but a lot of times I'm just there to support the younger generation, younger artists, if they need some advice, you need to talk to somebody about this and that. Because I am an elder state, I've been here for a long time, I'm doing a lot of things, you know, I might be in the, I, I'm kind of in the background because I've been here so long, you know, where, uh, but, you know, and also I got young kids, so they take up majority of my time, so. But I think uh, it has changed and it is going to change. We'll see five years, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, how, how um, I don't think it's going to die. I think it's going to flourish. And it has been flourishing for the last 10, 15 years. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you all for your response, in particular that question. It's wonderful that everyone still has hope. We know like the change is hard. It's continuous. It's a journey as opposed to a destination. Um, but when I hear artists be hopeful and um, excited for the changes that we can make and the things that we do have control over, uh, that's always just so wonderful to hear. Um, but we are close to time. So as we wrap, wrap up this event, I just want to end by saying thank you. Thank you so much to our viewers. Thank you so much to the artists for being here. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our exhibition, please visit our website, uh, cocaseattle.org, where you can view the installation um, of the works and as well as see all 15 works that are included in our virtual viewing room. Um, to uh, Quinn, Anak, and Che, uh, do you, can you please let us know uh, how people, what's the best way to reach out to you, whether it's website, social media, um, that kind of thing where they can find more of your art? Uh, yeah, you can just go on roxon.com, uh, R-A-W-K-S-O-N.com, or uh, uh, at Roxon on Instagram. So pretty much that. Same here. My website or my Instagram, I like uh, upload a lot of my recent work. So if you want to find me, just find me there. <laughs> yeah, and for me, uh, Art of Che on Instagram, Facebook, Tinder, TikTok, all, every, every, every social media. I don't, I don't discriminate. You can find me, you can find me on any <laughs> social media. Gotcha. Wonderful. I, uh, you know, check them out, check out all their work. It's, you know, beautiful. We can only pick one from each person. Uh, if we had the space, I would have included, you know, let's put it all up on the wall. I'm also eclectic and I, I, uh, I feel you on that one. Um, I would also like to encourage our viewers to visit our partner organizations' websites to learn more about their organizations. In addition to joining us next Saturday, December 19th at five o'clock uh, for our panel discussion with our partner organizations, Wanawari, La Sala, and uh, the Asian Pacific uh, Cultural Center. This event, that event will also be social distance safe and hosted through Zoom. Um, but I just want to say, Thank you. It's so lovely to see our community and um, thank you. <laughs>